In our last video, we tried to fix 4 broken PS3s. Only console number 2 can be fixed by replacing the NEC tokens. This time, I will try to fix the remaining consoles. I started by tearing down console number 4 to see if it has a Frankenstein mod installed. Unfortunately, it's just a normal backward compatible model with a 90 nanometer GPU. I put everything back together and check if I assemble everything correctly. Interestingly, this console now boots into the XMB menu successfully. Although we can turn on this console now, it doesn't mean that it is fixed. Anyhow, let's see what's inside. I can see PlayStation Home, which is a very valuable game these days. I also see other popular games such as Need for Speed and Devil May Cry. If you don't know what PlayStation Home is, you should check out Nagato's channel. He managed to bring back the whole PlayStation Home service. If you still have PlayStation Home installed on your console, I highly recommend you to contribute to his project. I'm going to extract the PlayStation Home data and send it to Nagato. In order to do that, I need to install custom firmware on this console. And it goes horribly wrong in the middle of the installation. That's why you should never try to install custom firmware when the console is not stable. I will let my friend Josh to explain what is happening here. The RSX processor is connected to the motherboard via a ball grid array, also known as BGA. When the processor heats up and expands, it introduces thermal stress to the ball grid array. Due to the fact that lead-free soldering is more fragile than the traditional one, cracks easily form over time, especially when there is continuous thermal stress. This causes a connection issue between the RSX processor and the motherboard. This is shown as 3034 in the Syscon error log, which means there is communication error between the RSX and the cell processor. When you heat up the processor with a high enough temperature, you melt the solder joints, which restores the connection temporarily. You might think the console has been fixed, but it's not, because the connection is not a solid one. Sooner or later, it will break again. If the problem is in the BGA, you can solve it by reballing the RSX processor. But if the problem is in the underfill, there's not much you can do. Because the solder joints under the die is protected by the underfill, there is no way to reball it. The best you could do is to swap the 90 nanometer processor with a 40 nanometer one, which has a much better underfill stability. There are already a lot of talented YouTubers out there demonstrating how to do the swap. You should definitely check them out. Now I will pass the time back to the channel owner, Amateur Hardware Repair. Thank you, Josh. Josh also has a YouTube channel. Feel free to check it out. Alright, back to my ugly voice again. To fix the Syscon error 3034, we need to deal with the RSX processor. Just like what Josh mentioned, depending on the real cause of 3034, we might want to fix it differently. Either way, we need to desolder the RSX processor from the motherboard as the first step. If you watch my previous videos, you know how bad my BGA rework skill is. I know I need more practice, and it's time to visit our sacred place, the PS3 graveyard. I picked a motherboard that is already dead, and tried to figure out how to remove the moisture. The phenomenon you see here is due to the moisture trapped inside the motherboard. I talked to another YouTuber who is really good at repairing PS3s. You should definitely check out his channel. He gave me some suggestions on how to remove the moisture. Basically, we need to pre-bake the motherboard for about 24 hours. If you search the term PCB pre-baking online, you can find a lot of information about it. So, it is actually a common practice in electronics manufacturing. If you look for the reason why, they all mention the same thing, removing moisture. So, I decided to buy a PCB pre-baker. But the cheapest one I can find is already over 200 USD, and shipping fee is not even included. I need to be creative, and this is the solution I come up with. A domestic kitchen oven. I picked the one with a high enough power output, and make sure it is large enough to fit in a PS3 motherboard. But it can only run up to 16 minutes. We will figure out a way to force it to run continuously for up to 24 hours. And of course, I bought a used one that costs me around only 22 USD. Here is the modified oven with a PS3 motherboard inside. I put tapes into the timer knob so that it will never go to zero. With this modification, the only way to turn off this oven is to turn off the main power. I know, it sounds dangerous, that's why I test run it for about 4 hours to make sure everything is okay. Then I run it overnight. The next day, my workshop is still there, 
it still hasn't been burned down by fire. I quickly bring over the motherboard to my rework station to prevent moisture from getting inside again. And then I set everything up and try to remove the cell processor. I also bought an infrared camera to double check the motherboard temperature and compare it to the reading of the thermal couple. The readings are quite close to each other, so everything seems to be okay. I wait for the motherboard to reach 220 degrees Celsius. In the middle of waiting, I realized that I forgot to apply any solder flux. So I apply it and we set up everything again. I turned on my hot air and the cell processor temperature continued to rise. The thermal couple reading is close to 200, but the infrared camera shows only about 170. I think the thermal couple is also measuring the air temperature around the processor. And the actual processor temperature is less than this value. Here, I was struggling to adjust the nozzle position. For some reason, the nozzle keeps bouncing up because I'm using a very cheap setup. I have been nudging the processor from time to time to see if it is ready to be removed. The motherboard temperature isn't increasing anymore, so I tune up the temperature of the preheater. I also add a little bit more flux because I was not sure if it was enough or not. The cell processor isn't moving at all, so I tune up the hot air temperature. I also try to bring the nozzle slightly closer to the processor, but the holder simply refuses to do so. So I have to hold it with my left hand. The thermal couple reading is close to 250, and the infrared camera is close to 210. The solder joints should start melting very soon. I nudge it one more time, and that's it. It's time to remove the RSX processor. Oh no, by the time I remove the nozzle and grab my tools, the solder joints has been cooling down too much. So I need to go back to the hot air heating again. This time, I make sure it is really hot enough before I remove the nozzle. I nudge the processor in two different directions to make sure all the solder joints are melted. Alright, processor removal the second time. Let's see how successful the removal is. There is no missing pad on the processor, so it's good. But on the motherboard, if you look carefully, there's one missing pad. I knew it. I felt like I torn up something during the processor removal. Even if there's only one missing pad, I would consider it as a failure. But I've learned how useful PCB pre-baking is. There is no more popcorning, and there's no more components jumping around the motherboard due to moisture. I also learned that the BGA solder joints melt at around 250 degrees Celsius when referring to the thermocouple readings. I talked to another YouTuber, RIP Felix, and asked him for advice. And he's so nice to share me the pictures of his own setup. If you don't know who is Felix, I highly recommend you to watch his videos, especially this one. He's one of the people out there who really understand what yellow light of death means to a PS3. After talking to him, I realized that I need to use aluminum foil to decrease the heat dissipation. So I wrapped the PS3 motherboard with aluminum foil during pre-baking. I used exactly the same motherboard as my previous attempt. With the cell and RSX processor removed, the only processor I can remove is the PS2 processor. This time, I remember to apply solder flux at the very beginning, and I wrapped the preheater around with aluminum foil. This allows the heat to stay under the motherboard so that it can be heated up to a higher temperature. I set the preheater to 300 degrees Celsius, which heats up the motherboard quickly to 150 degrees Celsius. After turning on the hot air station, the temperature quickly rises to 200 degrees Celsius. I continue heating it up for a few more minutes and nudge the processor from time to time to check whether it is ready to be removed. When I look back to this footage, I feel like I nudged the processor a bit too much. Anyhow, just like before, when the temperature reaches 250 degrees Celsius, the processor is ready to be removed. I would say the removal of the PS2 processor is successful. And I learned that aluminum foil is really effective. 
For my setup, the preheater need to be set to 300 degrees Celsius and the hot air station should be set to 280 degrees Celsius. Now, I'm confident enough to work on a working motherboard, but I'm running out of time for this video. In my next video, I'm going to show how to turn this into this. Thank you for watching. See you next time.